Good morning, everybody. First of all, big thank you to the VDA and to the organizers of the New Mobility World for having us here. I don't know how you think. When I walked the halls of the IIA over the past two days, I think it was mainly around two topics. First topic was electrification, obviously, right? But I think a lot of things have been said already. The second one was probably around, let's call it database technologies, database businesses, and namely artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence kind of seems to be a buzz, but it's right. Over the past two, three years, it has had a major breakthrough because the algorithms are there, because the computing power now is there, and also because the press of the data that you can access is there. But it feels like there has been also a little bit of a hype. And if you believe in something like that, which is kind of the exponential curve or the exponential growth of digital technologies, we could say today artificial intelligence is at the level of a mouse brain. And we could also say that if you believe in that, in such a Kurzweil curve, the artificial intelligence in roughly 15 to 20 years will be at the level of a human brain. And that creates probably a lot of buzz, a lot of questions, a lot of buster, probably. So we ask ourselves, is it really just buzz? Is it just hype? Or is there something in there that for the automotive industry could be actually interesting to have? And are there any applications that are worthwhile to pursue? And is this technology a competitive advantage? Is it something that I need to have? Or is it something that I probably don't need to have? I can sort it somewhere else, etc. We did three things to have a little bit of a fact-based discussion in order to discuss that. And uh, give me a second. Yes, here we are. And um, we had um, three approaches in order to answer that question. The first one was we asked the ones who are eventually going to pay for that or eventually going to use it and want to have it and have the pull of it, the consumers. So we asked over 3,000 consumers in the US, in Germany, and in China. Secondly, we followed the trail of the money, I would say, right? So we looked at the investments, because investments made in companies are usually a quite good predictor of how things are going to turn out. We looked at all the investments over the past six years that have gone into artificial intelligence and found five, nearly 500 firms that have very good knowledge of the technology or already are working on very good applications for that technology. And we found over 50 billion of investments over the past years. And lastly, we spoke basically to you, right? We spoke to OEMs, to suppliers, to ones, to startup companies, to tech companies in order to make sense of all the data that we found. You will find the, let's say, detailed findings, all of that in the brochures attached. I just want to use the 10 minutes I have today in order to give you three highlights of what we found and what I personally found very interesting about that. First of all, one might think the consumer is a little bit afraid of artificial intelligence and being driven rather being in the driver's seat. We found the consumers are actually going to love it. Secondly, we found it is a competitive advantage, right? But let's be very fact-based. Not just everything is AI. In automotive and mobility, it's a little bit more complicated, given regulations, standards, etc. And thirdly, we also found it's a very promising new value pool, but there are challenges that we need to master, and there are challenges that are still unsolved today. So let me deep dive into these three very quickly. Number one, I said consumers are probably going to love it. 
why I'm saying that. When we asked our panel and our population, only a quarter would at the moment, today, neglect the technology and say, no, it's too much of a risk. Half of the population that we asked, however, would already say, well, yes, I would put my family into a autonomy, level five autonomy driving car. And I find that, I find it pretty interesting. If I would say, right, if you would say, my daughter and her girlfriend step into that car, it drives you to the cinemas or it drives you to the school in the morning, it feels awkward, to be honest. But the comfort and the convenience that comes with it is going to persuade the consumer, we guess. And three quarters, they already see the advantage of that because it's going to drive the safety on the roads tremendously and probably going to drive down accidents. So that is a good news, right? Pretty good news. So there might be a pull from the consumer. They're probably going to like it. But be aware there's also quite some, quite some expectations attached to that. Consumers state, in average, they would expect to have a level 5 autonomous car on the road by 2022. I thought at first, to be very honest, when we asked this question, it's a stupid question. Why would you ask? I mean, the consumer doesn't know, right? The automotive industry probably knows. But I don't know how you think, probably you know it better, but at least from the discussions I have, 2022 for a level 5 autonomous car is pretty much unrealistic. Let's see. Let's prove me wrong. But the point I want to make is 2022, this is quite some expectation that we need to meet as mobility sector. So consumers are probably have a high interest. The question obviously is also, are they going to be willing to pay anything for it? So is there a new value pool? And first of all, we think there's risk for the existing value pools because the likeliness for consumers, for customers, car customers to switch the brand where today is a very big loyalty attached to it, skyrockets. If two-thirds of a BMW, Mercedes, VW, you name it, customer, would say, well, yes, I switch brand, just because I get a better automated driving experience in another car, it's actually quite significant. But on the other hand, we also found that these customers are actually willing to spend money they would spend money over 3,000 euros, some of them even over 4,000 euros, if we think in the traditional business model of selling something as an option. So there is actually a new value pool, and we think there might be a couple of value pools attached to it, might be in process optimizations, that is something the consumer probably not going to see, but enhanced products, voice gesture recognition, level four automated cars, level five autonomous cars, as well as new business models, think about car OEM moving to a B2B model in terms of becoming a city mobility provider or things like that um, is actually very interesting, but will be also very difficult. So first of all, consumers are probably going to love it. Second of all, let's ground base a little bit again. When we I mean, th there are very good definitions of what AI is and of what exactly machine learning is, and we are looking here very much at machine learning. Um, many, I think, of many of this buzz and of this hype is going to create it because many things are called intelligent today already, but they probably have nothing to do with artificial intelligence. If we apply a definition, and we made this a little bit, let's say, um, pragmatic, but we said it has, to be, it has to be able to cope with very complex situation, right? It uh, has to be learning or it should learn on itself without explicit instructions from a programmer. So and if you apply that, actually there are only very, very specific control points of application where machine learning will make the difference in a car. So to give you an example, like you have a car that drives, let's imagine that would be level five autonomy. It drives and there is an obstacle. So the typical discussion that we have, how to avoid the obstacle. Are you going to give the car 
the entire responsibility of managing that situation, given regulation and given that you need approval for your cars by the regulator, probably not. So we expect for decision making, for example, you might have a machine learning algorithm who manages, but he will only manage in very, very explicitly programmed guardrails. So that is a part of the application where you would see machine learning only to a certain extent. However, everything which happens before, like image recognition, you can only do via machine learning, to be very honest. You could try to program that explicitly, manually, um, everything where the machine learning algorithm you probably need to have one or two weeks to set it up, you would need over a thousand men years. So nobody would think about actually doing that. So when we think about AI applications, we need to think about in the car and in the mobility sector very exactly, do we think, does it make sense? So, and the third message I would love to bring to you today is we are not there yet. There are a couple of challenges that we need to master and that we need to watch out for. First challenge is probably the access to the technology. How can we gain access to technology? And the access to that technology has gotten very, very, very expensive over the past years. So when we did our analysis of the investments, we found of the over 50 billion that we found since 2010 that I mentioned before, 40 of them actually since 2014. In 2016 alone, the amount of investment 2016 alone equals the amount of all the four years together. So there's a tremendous uptake in money flow into that technology. So we need to think about how to gain access to that. Second question is around regulation and standards, we think. If you imagine a mobility system in 2025, you will have AI in the car, you will have in the cloud, you will have then the, the connection to the OEM. Probably a couple of OEMs will bundle together that in a neutral server. There has to be the connection to the traffic management system. So this system is so complex that if every OEM and every other player in this field of mobility tries to work with its own standards, the whole thing will just become too expensive and it won't work. So there's a great deal around trying to drive partnerships and collaborations together in order to find these standards and drive the required regulation. So, and thirdly, at least in my eyes, I think there's a big need for a shift in business model. And that's something that at least I grew up in the automotive industry. We lived from the traditional business model for a couple of decades now. We are not used to changing that, right? We are probably in the automotive industry, we usually are very, very good at testing technology. Right? Before a car hits the market, we test it with millions of miles or millions of kilometers. But we are not so good at testing business models. So I would encourage the entire sector a little bit also to do something around what we would call business model hatching. So while car OEMs driving the traditional business model still to a great extent, have a couple of small other business models developing, try this out and test this as you go. So there's a great deal of things that we might want to consider on the way to AI, partnerships, regulation standards, business model hatching, selecting the one, two, three applications that actually need AI and focus on these ones. To finish that off, one thing that we very often get asked is, well, if there's a race to technology, if there's a value pool, if there's something to gain, what do you think, who's going to be the one who wins, right? Who's the pole sitter? I think it's a little bit of an awkward question, um, and I will tell you why in a second. There's the notion of OEMs being too slow, uh, being too old, probably too big to move quickly and fast. But there's something other that we found and found very interesting. We ask consumers, who do you trust when the technology hits the market? And there's still a lot of trust in the traditional OEMs in order to carry that out in a way that the consumer would like it to have. But 
in the end, at least in our minds, that doesn't matter too much. So there's still a role for the OEMs, but there's as big as a role for tech companies, for startups that really master the technology, for suppliers that go probably from the traditional model into a partnership house model um, with the OEMs. So we think, and that is obviously not exhaustive, but just as kind of a picture, we think that it's going to be very, very important to work in collaborations, to work in partnerships, be it to find the right business model or carry out the right business model, be it to define the standards, etc. So I want to close with kind of answering the question that I posed at the beginning. Is it the bus or is it the buster for the mobility sector? We think there is actually quite a competitive advantage that you could gain with that, with that technology and the implications that are attached to it, voice recognition, gesture recognition, autonomous driving, and these things. But we also think that only in very specific control points of the applications, and also in partnerships and in collaborations where different capabilities come together and actually carry that out. With that, I think this is the best crowd probably to discuss such questions as I think there are participants here from all of the worlds that I just described, right? From consumers to OEMs to suppliers to tech companies to startups. So I'm very much looking forward to have the discussion with you. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you.